This week I learned that Larry McMurtry thinks all those books that you guys say are grimdark are laughable. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with another weekly update. It's kind of just getting towards the end of April here. Going to start looking ahead to May really a lot sooner and a lot faster than I expected. And that means that uh, I need to speed up a couple of things on the old TBR. And that leads me, guys, into what am I reading? So is the reading slump over? Well, I kind of went into this kind of little phase of the reading plan where I said, I'm going to be doing some stuff that's not fantasy for a minute, not sci-fi for a minute, to kind of see if I can get my groove back. And I consider Stephen King, even though it is kind of science fiction-y because it does deal with aliens and stuff, I decided that would be a good place to kind of start to shake off some of that rust. And I started Dreamcatcher last week, but I actually finished it over the course of this week. And look, I do like the book, but here's what I'm going to say. I can understand why so many people dislike it. I do think that the first one-third of this is peak Stephen King. It's great stuff. It almost feels like this was something he had kind of started and then he kind of finished it while he was sick because this was right after his accident and he was on a lot of pain medication. But uh, the reason I say that is because the first one-third of this book is so different. First third is like all that stuff you come to expect from Stephen King. It's got your great, your coming of age of uh, a group of friends that have kind of become lifelong friends and it's kind of flashing back and forward between the now and the back then and what made this bond so wrong or so strong and then kind of what is wrong wrong in the world and that they're trying to fix or something supernatural, I guess you would say. And those things are here. And it's great. And he also throws in a ton of that really just horrific sense of dread stuff that King is just great at. You know, he does all that stuff absolutely great up until, uh, if you know, you know, up until uh, the toothpicks in the toilet. Let's put it that part. After that part, it's almost like it's a completely different book. And it does kind of, I look, I'll give him credit for going for it. I really will, because there are things that he goes for it in here, but I can see why it, it jumps the shark completely for some people. Now, again, for me, when King is dealing with aliens, I prefer this over Tommyknockers. I would reread this again before I revisit Tommyknockers, but apparently I am in the unpopular opinion on that stance because of pretty much everyone else like, no, I, I kind of like Tommy Knockers compared to this. All I remember about that book is a lot of farting. And it does, guys. There's a lot of flatulence in this book, like a ton. <laughs> but, you know, to this day, guys, I still say shame shit different day every time someone asks me how the day is going. And I realize I shouldn't be saying that at work. It probably doesn't come over very well. But that's just something that I picked up from this book when I read it for the first time 20 plus years ago and I still use today. So I feel like is there some nostalgia in here? Maybe, maybe, but maybe it just has some of those things that I love that King is able to do. Like I said, with the group of young friends, you know, and kind of uh, going through some trials together and seeing that they've become, they've been lifelong friends and that, you know, where they are at now, their lives are all very different. They're all having major, major flaws. Some are suicidal, some are, you know, alcoholics. It's just so many things about it. That's great. You can see King wrote a lot of himself in the main four characters here because there's the potty mouth kid. There's the uh, the kid that's, uh, I guess you say, uh, when they're older, there's one that's suicidal. There's one that, you know, has been in a major car accident, got hit by a car. Obviously, that was very, very fresh to King. And then there was someone who's dealing with alcoholicism, which King has always battled with. So King is always really good at writing some of his own demons out in these pages. But when you get to Colonel Kurtz, Colonel Kurtz, that's <laughs> Colonel Kurtz is uh, actually from Apocalypse Now, which I could tell Stephen King watched before he wrote this because there is a character called Kurtz. And there are other things, like there is basically the Flight of the Valkyries kind of scene in this book. But uh, I, I enjoy it. But again, I can see why people don't. It would, just, it would never recommend that you go here first. In fact, I would say when you're first finding King, you're going through the greatest hits, I would say wait on this one for a while. Because I think if you're used to his quirks and some of the stuff that doesn't work so good for him, you'll be more accepting of a book like this. If you read this really early on, you might say, the hell is Mike talking about with the Stephen King guy? So again, I enjoy it, but I can definitely see why others do not. And we'll get into it more when I do my Into the Multiverse about it here in a few months. I'm going to be, uh, be doing You Like It Darker and Thinner before that, but uh, I guess the month after that, so June probably, I'll be doing my Into the Multiverse for Dreamcatcher, but I'm very, very happy to be starting back on my Stephen King reread. And after I finish that, guys, I started Streets of Laredo by Larry McMurtry, 
which is, if you might not know, is the sequel to Lonesome Dove, one of my favorite books I have ever read. And guys, look how fast I'm flying. This is everything that I wanted it to be. This is just what I needed. This is why I moved it up. I didn't plan to do this until June when my wife and my kids and I go on our family vacation. I had planned on taking this book with me on that trip, but I moved it up because like I said, I was struggling with this reading slump. And I said, I needed a change of genre. What's a bigger change in American Old West? And guys, this is awesome. The best thing that I can tell you is that it's very, very clear to me that Larry McMurtry did not forget how to write between the writing of Lonesome Dove and this because I am sucked right back into that world, right back with those those characters, and I am absolutely loving it. Now, I will tell you, chapter two, I was shocked because I was like, oh, great, I can't wait to see some of these characters again. And Larry McMurtry's like, status update, dead. And I'm like, whoa, slow down. So yeah, he um, he's not afraid to off some of those characters, but there's a lot of those characters from Lonesome Dove that are here, so I think you'll be happy. But there will be some big surprises. Big, big surprises. But seeing what Captain Call is up to now is actually quite interesting and he's writing this and uh, this antagonist in here that makes blue duck seem like a softy because uh joey garza whoo you know i'm loco i mean big time this kid has got it bad man i mean this is i think this was a lot more graphic and, and, and again i don't think he ever writes it in a way that you're gonna be like oh i had to put that down because he was just being too disgusting it's just some of the acts that joey's doing you're like holy crap this kid is messed up so yeah it's dark but he's not super over descriptive with it so you'll be fine with that but uh yeah messed up stuff in here messed up stuff and again what i said when i reviewed lonesome dove is the hardest thing about that time period was just staying alive and that's still very much true in this especially when you see what has happened to some of our characters from lonesome dove but i'm loving this i don't have any doubt i'll be finishing this up uh, over the course of the next week because it's just so good i'm already uh, i guess i just started just starting part two here so it's got three parts i'm starting part two and uh yeah, uh, I'm loving it. I, and the thing is, I like the new characters too. The new character, like Brookshire, is one I've really, really got invested in rather early. And uh, so it isn't just about it isn't just like the Joey and the Call show. Brookshire is a pretty interesting character too. And uh, and uh, Pi Pi is is really good. He's he's returned from Lonesome Dove, and he's got a really good storyline going on right now. So I'm very very pleased to uh, to, to know that uh, is it going to end up topping Lonesome Dove for me? I doubt it. I doubt it just because Lonesome Dove was just so special, but it definitely feels like a worthy follow-up. And that's really all I could have asked for with a book like this. And uh, yeah, I see no way I'm not going to read the other two uh, Lonesome Dove books now because uh, Larry McMurtry, he knows what it is that I like and I like what it is that he does. Let's go ahead and move along to what am I going to read. Obviously, I'm going to finish Streets of Laredo this week, guys. And the only thing I have left on my list, I'd be shocked if I finish them both this month, but Priest of Gallows and Priest of Crowns, this is books three and four of War for the Rose Throne by Peter McLean. I really, really enjoyed the first two books. I've heard these two get a little divisive. I'm not really sure. It seems like some love them. Some are like, ah, I wish it stayed more like books one and two. I'm not sure what to expect, really. But the thing is, like more people than not have said they really do like it, and I'm expecting to. And uh, again, I look. you look at this, this is probably... No, it's probably not shorter than Lonesome Dove here. I mean, I feel like I can get through these two probably as fast as I'm going to get through this. I don't know. We'll see. But hopefully, uh, again, I feel like if that reading slump is over, I do feel like if I'm getting back into fantasy, that's the kind to get back into because it is very much like a street level. It's not just swords and shields and prophecies and dragons, which I love those things, you know, but I did need a quick little break for them. Had some people ask me about uh, Sun Eater probably next month probably next month. I don't I don't imagine I'm going to get all those and a massive brick of a Sun Eater book. So I'll probably try to get uh, the Sun Eater book in early next month. So I'll have to roll that one over once again. But again, like I said, to me, uh, what's where's the fire? What's the rush? Of course, I want to read the next Sun Eater book, but I want to make sure I'm in the right frame of mind because I like to give those books the brain power I feel like they deserve. And for me, they require all of it because I ain't got I ain't got much when it comes to Christopher's books. Uh, he he usually has to explain it to me like I'm five, and I and I love him for that. How about this week on the channel, guys? I do a couple of things. Something I had kind of put off for a couple of weeks now because I was still waiting to get everything together was a Why You Should Read for the Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn. This is one I've wanted to do for a long time because that was one of the first. Uh, I guess you say ongoing series I really tackled hard on the channel early in the early days is I really was all about coverage of Faithful in the Fall when I first started doing it because I was encouraging so many new people to read it with me 
and it was just an experience and i loved it so much the reason i haven't actually done this video before is like i don't know how i could do that video in under half an hour so i did it in about 23 minutes <laughs> you know so that was a little bit of, of cutting and stuff there and i still didn't get everything that i wanted to talk about because there's just so much that goes on in those four books i feel like it's just such a great gateway series like if you think okay i'm, I'm above like the brandon sanderson level but i'm not quite ready for like joe abercrombie when i'm talking about like i don't mean like talent i mean like by content you know so i i'm okay with with moving away something a little bit more into adult fantasy but i'm not ready to see over the top sex scenes and 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 entrails being tied around trees and stuff i'm not quite ready for that i think that john gwen is perfect perfect sweet spot between those two it is it is adult epic fantasy but you know he's gonna be low on the bad language and he's not gonna have a lot of the the sexual content and things so i think that it has you know it's about war so there's gonna be lots of violence in him and things like that. But he's not going to linger. He's not going to linger and sit there and tell you everything that is actually happening on the page. So I, I appreciate that. And I, I, I think that's why it's a perfect gateway if you're just starting to get into epic fantasy, adult fantasy, because it does have the huge world, the several different regions and lands and countries. And you have so many different houses and characters and lore and all these histories and backstories and stuff. So there is a lot to keep track of. And I think he does a good job of at first you feel like it's overwhelming, it's too much, but after a little bit you'll start to get into it. I say about halfway through Malice, you'll have all the characters and the alliance is kind of straight enough to keep going with the story. And by the end of it, you will have an opinion about just about every character. You know, love to hate them, hate to love them, a little bit of both. But it does character arc so great for me. Like I look at where where Kaiwen and Corbin start the story and where they are at the end of the story, and it's amazing. It's just amazing growth. It's like it's like a, I'm like a proud dad watching my kids grow up through the course of that series. You know, from preteens to young adults that are going to kind of be running the world. It's it's really really a fun journey for me, and it to me it has one of the best character arcs I've ever read in fantasy of Maquin because Maquin is a character that I thought was just kind of the Obi Wan Kenobi kind of character in book number one, and that character has an incredible arc through that series and that's why i wanted to kind of talk about that give it a nice little epic reading treatment that I did and i want to thank john and ed and will gwen all for sending me art to use for that introduction they've all been very they've all dropped me messages about how appreciative they are of the video and i'm very appreciative that they were able to help me get that video to where i wanted it to be and i hope it'll bring new people to that series because i think it is a wonderful series i think john has not wrote a bad book yet uh, I've loved everything that I've read from him. I can't wait for book three of Bloodsworn. And I love Bloodsworn. I love A Blood and Bone. But to me, Faith in the Fallen will always be special. And what I say in that video is I don't reread. I'm saying I'm not going to be rereading very much anymore. But I will reread that. Because I think there's a lot of foreshadowing and stuff in those books. And I just kind of feel like I want to revisit those friends again. Because I did just adore those characters that he wrote. And I'd love to say hello again. I hope you guys will check them out. Something I did um, later in the week was I just talked about something that, that Johan over at, over at Library of a Viking brought up. Is He was talking about uh, why are booktubers quitting. And I just kind of expanded on a little bit, gave my side of it, what I think it was. Because I thought it was a very interesting topic. And all credit to him. I, I definitely wanted to make sure I give him credit because it was his idea that I was kind of piggybacking off of. I just kind of give my point of view of on why I think new tubers, uh, year plus tubers, and long time tubers are getting off the platform. Not just booktubers, but YouTubers in general. What is going on? Why are so many people quitting? What is the deal? And really a question I got a lot when I talked about my, when I did my five year live stream was, you know, how are you, how can you, how can you keep doing this for so long? You know, you're, you're so consistent. How are you able to do this? How, how are you not, have you ever thought about quitting? Things like that. So I felt like I talked about what keeps me going with it, you know, and I felt like that was a, a as positive as a message you can give in a topic like that. And to say, if this is what you're wanting, you know, then you should do this. If you're wanting to do this, then maybe you should think about these pitfalls before you start. So it's almost more like a, a cautionary tale, I think, but also just kind of an analysis of why I think people are bailing, you know, and, and why YouTube isn't really making it easy for a lot of creators. So uh, who knows? That video might get me in trouble. I don't know. We, we, time will tell on that one. But it was a it was a deeply personal topic, so I want to kind of give it the attention it deserved, even if it wasn't really necessarily about books or anything. But it's more for content creators, and uh, hopefully they can find reasons to keep going because I want everyone to keep going in this community because uh, we need you. We need all of you. And then just a, a quick book trailer of uh, Shogun. That was one I wanted to do because I just I spent a lot of time 
on that uh, on that reading excerpt, and not many people have watched the Shogun review, and that's just uh, always going to be a thing. Is that's why I decided to keep the trailers that I do for those, or the reading excerpts, and just kind of release them later as trailers because I do spend a lot of time on those, and I know that not my most popular content is not my actual book reviews. So you know, hopefully, you know, it'll give people a chance to to check that out, and maybe it'll encourage them to actually either watch the review or go and pick up the book as I as I want. But it was something that people have always told me this, you know, hey. Uh, I wish you'd make a book trailer for me. You know, my book would have sold more and stuff. And that's that's insanely flattering. I really do appreciate that. But to me, it's all about the words on the page that I'm reciting to you because that's what makes those stories so powerful for me was the words on the page. And I hope that does come across in those trailers. How about some next week plans, guys? Got a couple of things on the docket here. I'm going to be going back into the multiverse. Like I said earlier, I'm going to be talking about Thinner. Now, this is a Richard Bachman story, but this was after people knew that he was Richard Bachman. Thinner is another one of those light dream catchers that seems to get dragged a lot by Stephen King fans, but I can tell you for a fact, because I reread this one like three years ago, I love it. This is my favorite Bachman besides The Long Walk. I love Thinner. I think Richard the Hammer is one of the greatest side characters ever in a Stephen King story, and I can't wait to talk about it, because I think that the concept is just chilling and that book has some really really freaky stuff in it and i cannot wait to get into it because it's just such a fun story now the bachman stuff probably isn't the best content for into the multiverse because there's not a lot of connections because it's outside of the multiverse but you know what unless it's like retroactively and i have to really think about it i have to think about if thinner actually has some stuff in there that's actually uh connected into the multiverse i'm not sure i'm not sure honestly thinking about it now on the spot but i don't know but i'm very excited to go talk about that because i do love thinner and I think it's quite underrated. I'll be talking about my TBR for May of 2024, which I have no idea what it's going to be right now, guys. No idea. Besides Disquiet Gods, I have no idea what's going to be on that list in May. I have like a rough draft, but until I actually put it on that Excel spreadsheet, it doesn't actually stay on my TBR. So we'll see. That should be an adventure, right? But I'd like to give you guys enough time in case you want to join me on any of those to let you know what I'm going to be reading. So that will be happening at the latter end of the week. Uh, speaking of Library of a Viking, he and I have been talking about doing a talk about nothing for a while. Problem is there a time zone difference? Uh, it's, I, I, I'm not trying to get him to come on with me at 1 o'clock in the morning his time. And that's why it makes it harder on the weekday. So we're talking about getting a weekend together, either Saturday, my time, Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon or something like that. And uh, we haven't really nailed that down yet, but we are working on it. I've been putting him off for a while. And that's my fault. That's entirely my fault. Just uh, my scheduling got all screwed up while they were doing all those home renovations and stuff. But now that life is getting back to normal, I'd like to actually resume with the talk about nothing. And I'd love to pick Johan's brain and find out how does he have so much success on Instagram? I just now am just about to hit 10,000 followers on Instagram. He's got like 20 something thousand. He's, 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 he's a machine. He is a machine. So uh, I, I feel like maybe I can learn a few things from him during that discussion. As for some TV and movie talk before I go real quick, I only have one thing. Uh, we have our family movie nights on Monday and this was one I'd never seen. We'd, we'd take a turn picking and my wife actually picked a movie I had never seen, a football movie I had never seen. So believe that. I mean, I am a huge American football fan. I feel like I've seen just about everything. I love Denzel Washington. I had never seen Remember the Titans and she just like dropped her drink on the floor when I told her I'd never seen it. And she said she knows what she's picking for our next movie night. Now my youngest, he's not really crazy about the football. So he, he bailed. My oldest stayed and watched with us, but a uh, great movie. Great, great movie. I didn't I didn't expect it not to be. It's got a big legacy. A lot of people carry on about just how great it is, but just amazing performances. You love all the kids in that movie. It's just amazing, amazing character work. What that script is, is just a brilliant script. And of course, Denzel. I think Will Patton's an actor that's really underrated. I think he does a lot of Stephen King audiobooks, I've been told. That's really interesting. But a lot of actors in that that like you wouldn't know at that point, like Ryan Gosling's in it. Uh, Hayden Pantier, Pant 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 Save the Cheerleader, Save the World. I can never say her last name. She's in it, but she's like eight years old or something. So it's one of those where it's like you look at back at it, you're like, oh wow, this had a lot of budding stars in it. But just an amazing, amazing flick. And uh, yeah, it really, really did. We'll tug on the heartstrings there at the end. It's a very, very good movie. And highest recommends if you haven't seen it. I feel like I'm the last one to ever see it. And people are, are always just shocked when I said I hadn't seen it. And sometimes it just works that way. There's a really popular movie that you know you would like. You just never get around to seeing it. And that was one for me. And has Denzel ever put in a bad performance? Like, I can't think of one time I've ever watched a Denzel Washington movie and been like, you know what? 
That movie could have been better if Denzel didn't drag it down so much. No, that guy's automatic. He's a legend, no doubt. He is one of the best to ever do it. And that's a, that's a really, really great football movie that's appropriate, I think, for any age. It really is. I don't really have very much else TV and movie stuff. I had someone ask me how I feel about Dune being on digital already. Uh, it's still in theaters, so if you want to still go in theaters, you can. If you want to watch it at home, you can. I, I don't know. I, I think it's cool that stuff does come on digital so much quicker now because I don't go to the cinema very often, so I actually appreciate that. But I understand if they feel like it's going to like hurt the experience. Look, you, we shot it from the mountaintops for people to go see Dune in IMAX, the biggest, loudest screen you can. It's been a couple months. You know, if they didn't do it by now, they're probably not going to. You know, so as long as more people are watching it, that's what I care about. I want more people consuming the world of Frank Herbert at all costs. Outside of that, not really doing much. I mean, we're we're, we're still watching a little bit of Fallout. We're still watching Shogun. Uh, we got uh, we're one episode behind. We haven't watched this past Tuesday's episode of Shogun, but we'd like to watch the last two episodes of a show to, to, like back to back so we're going to wait and let 9 and 10 and then we're going to watch them together and my wife has no idea what is coming it's been so much fun experiencing that with a non-reader and experiencing it as a reader Shogun what amazing amazing achievement that show is so good I hope they let this team uh, continue on with Taipan or Gaijin I would love them to continue with the Asian saga even though it will encourage me to read it faster that's for sure but I just knowing how much they care about the sword material I will whatever the showrunner does next if it's an adaptation I'll be very interested in checking it out because uh, this is one of those rare instances where it's like the source material matters and it's just so hard to find uh, directors and writers and showrunners that want to do that anymore, that want to honor the source material. That's how it feels like, to me at least. So, uh, again, incredible achievement. And Fallout, what a surprise that's been. I talked about it a lot last week, but, you know, it's pretty much like unanimous, like damn near everyone. People that have played the games love it. People that have played the games are really put off by it at first, but then they grow to love it. And the thing that I'm hearing is that uh, on Game Pass, they're saying that Fallout 3 and 4 is having more new users than ever since that series came out. That's exciting. That's exciting. Fallout 4 is getting a, the next-gen update here, I think, next week. And that's really cool because my wife never actually played Fallout 4, so she's waiting for that, and she's going to start a new a new game on Fallout 4 on the uh, Series X. So really cool time uh, for, you know, I, I'm, I hope I feel, I feel like the tide's turning maybe. Maybe we're getting to the point where we're actually going to start getting uh, not necessarily just faithful adaptations, but adaptations that feel respectful of the source material. That's really where I feel like I would be excited about it. So you're getting people in charge that care about the source material. And that was my biggest problem when I said, why can't they get fantasy adaptations right? Because they weren't hiring the right people. They weren't hiring people that cared about the product. And it, to me, it seems like, uh, which Nolan is it? Christopher Nolan's brother. I can never remember his name. Is it that Nolan, that Nolan definitely seems like he cared about the lore and the history of Fallout and was respectful to the fans, but didn't feel beholden to them. You know, they're saying telling original stories in that world and not just relying on Easter eggs or, well, let me fix this, let me do my own thing or whatever. Uh, I felt like that 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 article was very very poorly worded because you you cannot watch the Fallout show and be a Fallout fan and I say this feels like a love letter to the world of Fallout without a doubt. So I'm loving it. I'm having a great time. And again, Walton Goggins needs to be cast in everything going forward. That guy is just a killer. I love watching him do his thing. But guys, that was my week. I would love to know what your week's been like. What are you watching? What are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you playing? Drop in the comments and let me know and have yourselves an awesome, awesome weekend.